Good evening, everyone. God bless you guys. Great to see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us online. God bless you guys. Um, you're in our hearts. You're in our prayers. Um, we were just praying before, and um, it's pretty awesome when we get to gather together and we get to pray for one another and encourage one another. Um, if you're in the area, uh, we meet at 6 p.m. Pacific uh, for prayer. So please drop by and uh, come watch in person if you're close enough. But like I said, if you get here a little early, you can you could we do prayer before service. Uh, 10 a.m. on Sundays and 6 p.m. on on Wednesdays. So it's it's uh, great to be in a, a body of believers, of praying believers that they know the importance of prayer. Um, we're going to read a little bit about that tonight. So uh, before that, uh, let's pray now. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. And uh, it's the only name that we're we're able to come to God, the Father, uh, is in his name, Lord, because of what he did on the cross, what he accomplished on the cross, Lord God. You bridge that that gap between us, Lord God. Um, at once we were an enemy with, with you, Father, but uh, your son, our Lord, uh, laid his life down for us, Lord God, and we are so grateful, Lord, that, that we're able to come to you, Lord, with confidence, with boldness, Lord God, and we can ask you help in time of need, we could praise you, we could we could bless you, we could bring pleasure to you, Lord God, by our words, thoughts, and deeds, Lord God. Would you help us tonight, Lord, learn from your word? Would you help us to be changed by it? Would you help us to grow in love and in faith? Would you help us to um, not leave here the same, Lord God? Would you help us to inch closer and closer to you, to your son, Jesus? Help us to be led by his spirit so that we don't fulfill the desires of our flesh, Lord God, ever Lord, help us to always flee, Lord God, from sin, flee from idolatry, and uh, turn to you, our, our Lord of lords, our King of kings. So help us to uh, uh, bow our hearts today, Lord God, and, and come before you, Lord, and, and would you help us grow, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So tonight we're going to be in Exodus 32. We're going to be in Exodus 32, and uh, the title of this message is Destroying Idols, Destroying Idols, um, in in kind of hard to remember i mean not for for some of us some of that's been some of you that have been believers for a long time but uh before you actually uh decided to to follow jesus before you decided to serve the lord you would have had to uh, destroy your idols because you cannot serve um any other gods but the one true god um we cannot take our 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 our, our sin with us um in this walk, as we're walking and following the Lord, the Lord took the, our sins from us on the cross, and He's going to continue to take sin from us as we turn from it and turn to Him. And He's going to be sanctifying us. He's going to be changing us and molding us and conforming us. And um, and uh, He's just so good that He doesn't. We come as we are, but He doesn't leave us as we are. Thanks be thanks be to God for that, because I definitely don't want to be um, who I was yesterday or the day before or the year before, or the year before that. And even today, I want to grow. I want to keep growing, and I want to keep getting to know the Lord. And I think that we should all strive for that that, that completion and that maturity that, that only God can give us, that only God can give us. But for, for that to happen, we need to destroy the idols in our lives. We need to destroy anything that stands between us and God, any hindrance, any encumbrance, any sin that in, entangles us. We need to turn from it. We need to turn to God. So that's basically the message today. We're going to hear about the Israelites and, 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 um, and what, what happened shortly after their deliverance from Egypt. We've been going through Exodus. Last time we were here last week, we were in uh, Exodus 24, where um, the, the covenant, the covenant between God and his people was uh, affirmed by, by the blood, by the blood. The blood was um, by Moses. He goes up the mountain, he meets with, with God, and he comes down to tell the people the word of God. And the people agreed and said, we will, we hear and we will obey, we'll listen. So they said they would obey the covenant and the, the blood was, 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 was thrown on the, the altar. The blood was thrown on the people. Uh, this confirmed the covenant between God and, and the people. And then uh, they went up the mountain and they, and they had a mill. They had a mill on top of the mountain. The presence of God was there. The consuming fire was there and they had a mill. And it just reminds us of, of that day that we're going to get to see God 
we're going to get to see God, and he's not going to be veiled. It's going to be face-to-face. It's going to be in all his glory, the, the word says, that we're going to see Jesus as he is, and we're going to get to have a meal. We're going to have to have a meal, a great feast, a great banquet, and I'm not sure exactly what's going to be there, but I know it's going to be awesome. I know it's going to be great. So is anybody looking forward to that, to one day? To one day there being no more tears or no more pain or no more cancer, no more, no more death? How about no more war? How about no more fighting and, and, and strife? No more temptation, right? No more sin, no more devil. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. But until then, we have to fight. We have to fight the good fight, the good fight of faith, right? Without, without, without that, it's impossible to see God. And if we want to see God and be with him, one God, we need to learn to live by faith and not by sight. But it's hard sometimes, right? Because we, we have an invisible God. And we see how hard it was for the Israelites to, to hold on to that faith at, at the invisible God. Although they've seen the manifestations, they've seen the miracles, they've seen God move and do things in their lives, and they still had they still had um, lack of faith. They still doubted. They still had their doubts, and they turned they turned away. They turned from the way, and we could learn a lot from that. The, the First Corinthians chapter ten tells us we those are our examples. What we read in the Old Testament, what we read in Exodus, are, are examples for us not to crave the things that they crave, to to fall into the same sin pattern that they fell into, and to go through the wilderness that we're in, trusting God and depending on God, and following God, because he knows what's best for us, because he loves us. He created us in his image, and he, he, he wants the best for us, and he wants to bless us. So we just need to um, receive, receive what he has for us. He has something way better for us. So that's where we were in, in Exodus 24. Now we're going to, they were on top of the mountain. Moses came down with them. He went back up. The Lord called them back up to give them the, 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 the stone tablets, where the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments were going to be on, and he was going to be up there for 40 days and nights, and Moses goes and he enters the mountain. It was a consuming fire. Our Lord is a consuming fire, and the people saw. The people saw this, and they heard God, and uh, they saw God, it says. Um, although they saw a form of God, they were not killed. So here we are in uh, Exodus 32. Exodus 32. I'm going to read through. We're just going to go get into, we're going to go to about verse, let's see, verse 20 today. We won't be able to finish. It's a long chapter, but we're going to get to about verse 20. So let me read through, and then we'll come back. Exodus 32, verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down, remember he had went up for 40 days and 40 nights, and he told them, just wait here, Aaron, wait here. Anybody has any problems, go to Aaron. So he goes up the mountain. He says, now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed to it, and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are a stiff-necked or an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, and you have brought out, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. 
Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he had said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing, engraved with, on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, it is not the sound of cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of cry of defeat, but the sound of singing I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned. He threw the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf, which they had, which, which they had made, and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scouted it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Oh boy, this is a lot there. So we see here, it didn't take long, right? They had just, they had just agreed, agreed to the covenant that they made with God, that God made with them. And the, we, they, twice, if you guys remember from uh, chapter 24, twice they said, yes, we agree, we hear. And then the second time, we agree, we agree and we'll obey. And then before you know it, they went back to idolatry, back from that 400 years of slavery they were in. They were building monuments to other gods. They were building temples to other gods. They were building um, idols. That's what they were doing. For 400 years, they were doing it for Pharaoh, and they went back to that. They went back to what they had been doing for so long. It reminds me of like like Jesus taught, like a, a pig returns to the mud. I have pigs. I have a little mini farm at my house. And boy, I could get them, and I could clean up their, their pen and get them. And, and as soon as they get a chance, they knock over their water trough, and they're just back in the mud again. And I'm like, oh, I just clean them up. Or then it's like a, a dog that returns to his vomit. It's like, oh, what insanity. What insanity that we do sometimes. We go back to the things that, that, that we used to do that we thought brought us this pleasure until the Lord opened our eyes and let us see the filth of our sin, and we were able to turn from it. God, by his grace, was, was, we gifted us the, that, that gift of repentance where we were able to just turn from it and, and turn to him and that freedom and those weights that were, were lifted from us when we understood his forgiveness. We understood how much he delivered us from and saved us from only to fall back into those things. And, 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 and boy, if you're, sometimes we just want to, you know, it, sometimes you just want to just, Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Lord, what did, what did I do? Lord, and you just, and it, you find that it's worse than it was before, you know, worse than it was before. You think you could maybe entertain things and you go back to them and you're like, no, it's, and here we see the people going back to things they, that they were engulfed in before they were in slavery and God saved them. So in, back in verse one, the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain. So starts here in the beginning. What happened? Moses was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. It was, wasn't that long, and it was about up. It wasn't going to be another day or so. Moses was going to come back down with the commandments, and he was probably hoping he was going to see them and be like, they were waiting for him, and all right, Moses is back. God's representative. Remember, Moses was God's man. He spoke for God. He, had a, he communicated with God. He saw God, and he was speaking, for, he was speaking for the, on behalf of the people, interceding for the people a type of Christ as he makes intercession for intercession with us, with the Father. Moses makes intercession for the people, and that was God's man. And, and he was probably so, you know, I'm going to be coming down there. Here we got the, the, these laws that they agree to, and it's going to be, they're going to have, we're going to, we probably will have a celebration unto the one true God. Instead, he comes back to this. So he's up there, and they thought it was a delay. How, how many times do we... When we don't see God, when we don't see God, we're like, what, what, when, when things, when trials happen, when we're going through things in life, it's so hard sometimes when we have, we have an invisible God, when we don't see God, or sometimes we don't, we don't hear God, you know, or we, we pray and we read and, and the prayers aren't answered fast enough for us. Why, Lord? I've been praying for years for my son or my daughter or, or, or my, my, my wife or my husband, you know, and we've been praying these prayers, Lord, 
intervene and we're waiting and we're waiting and waiting and we don't see God. We don't see him move, right? That's where faith comes in, where we believe who God is and what he said is true. We believe what he's done and what he's always doing and what he's doing presently and what he will do. But sometimes it can be real hard because he is an invisible God. God is spirit and he's an invisible God. But they seen, they seen the power of God. They seen the consuming fire. They seen him part the sea. They seen him do all these things. Yet, it's been 40 days and 40 nights and there was no word. So they're waiting. And how hard is it sometimes to just wait? To just wait, to just wait in the Lord. We know that New Testament comes that Jesus, according to Colossians, is the invisible God. So we know that God revealed himself in Jesus. So we have Jesus. But even now we're like, okay, Jesus is in heaven. Okay, Jesus is in me. But where is he? And sometimes we're just like, where is he? We're praying and we're wondering, where is he? Is he working? Is he working? And it's, it's our faith that we need to ask the Lord to increase. Lord, increase our faith. Teach us, Lord, to live by faith and not by sight. Blessed are those who believe without seeing, who believe without seeing. And sometimes just waiting on God is the hardest thing to do. Just waiting on him, just waiting on him to work. And they were waiting 40 days, 40 nights. And they're like, oh, we came out of Egypt. We had it good back there. They were in slavery for 400 years. And they were starting to think, oh, man, but the gods that we made back then, you know, at least we were able to do this. And the Egyptians were able to have good lives. They used to party and they used to celebrate and they used to have these kind of feasts and revelry and things like that when they were worshiping their gods. And they had been part of that for all those years. So it was something that they were familiar with. So it isn't hard to, to, to figure out that they just went right back. It was, it was natural for them to go back to something they had been doing for so long, even though they had made an agreement with God. This happens sometimes with newer believers, right? Younger believers, freshly out of slavery to sin, uh, just learning how to, 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 to overcome the sin in their lives, to understanding by the word, understanding what sin is in their lives. And it's not like God just makes them perfect from day one or makes any of us perfect from day one. He perfects us, right? He perfects us. He changes us. And it's a process. It's a process. The more we come to the Lord, the more we seek the Lord, the more we, we get into his word and we're, we're renewed and we get rid of that old thinking and we start having the mind of Christ and start thinking what he wants us to think and following his way. He changes us. But as some younger believers, they kind of play that, that, that teeter-totter where they kind of go back to this and they realize it's just not the same anymore. But for some of the older believers, it ought not be like that. As we grow up, we... we, we we put, a, we put away those childish things and we, grow, we, 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 we hope to grow to maturity. And it's sad when we see believers who have been believers for a really long time still going back to their, their, their sins. And, and I'm telling you guys, the days are getting darker. The days are getting darker. Or we need, and the, those of you who have been walking with the Lord, the younger believers need you. The, 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 the church as a whole, needs you. It needs the wisdom of the older believers. So it's, to, it's just time to lay aside the old and put on the new. It's time to just move forward and, and just, just forget about what lies behind and press forward towards the upward call of what God's called you to and be effective in whatever God called you to do. And it's time to just close the door on the world and just keep following God because at the end of the day, that's all we have is Christ. Amen? But it, nevertheless, it, it's waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. But if you wait on the Lord, it says in Isaiah 40, he shall renew your strength. Those that wait on the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. If we're waiting on the Lord, if we're seeking the Lord, he's always working. He'll renew our strength. When we're seeking him, he'll fill us with the joy, the joy of God, the joy of Christ. And that will renew our strength. He will get us to be, to be able to go through trials and still have joy and still be effective for his kingdom and still be able to minister to others and, and complete the work that he, he called us to do since the foundation of the world. And we, we can keep running and we won't go weary and we'll walk and not faint. But it takes perseverance. It takes patience, endurance, steadfastness, self-control, Diligent. We have to be diligent and intentional about our walk. We have to learn to, to be disciplined 
need to be disciplined. We talked about this last time, really spending time with the Lord and seeking the Lord and making time for him and prioritizing our, our life and our schedule around him. And, and, and what we're to do is just go to him and not go to the world or not go to, for sure not go back to our old lifestyle or our old sins or our old habits because those things never satisfy us. They never satisfy us and they never will satisfy us. You know, so we don't do the things of the world. The world looks for peace. The world has the, 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 the worldly wisdom. Hey, just get, take a little bit of this. Take the edge off. You'll be okay. Hey, smoke a little bit of that. Hey, just go, just go here and, and, and experience this. You'll just get your mind off of it. You know? you know, you just need to get out of there. Just get rid of them. Get rid of them. Don't talk to them anymore. Hey, you could, free, you, could you know, forgive them. Just forget about them. You don't need to talk to them. Get rid of them. Things like that. This is what the world will tell you. The world will say, yeah, what has your God done for you? You're still in this trial. You're still going through this. Why isn't the God, you know, if you're, why isn't the God taking the suffering away from you? You know, suffering is, is, is meant for us to learn obedience and dependence on God. It's meant for us to build up our endurance, and that's what we're going to need in these last days. We're going to need endurance. We're going to need perseverance. There's tribulation coming upon the world such as it's never seen before. And it's going to be brother against brother and sister against sister. And there's going to be hard. I mean, it's going to just be crazy, just like it was a few years ago. But just imagine that on steroids. You know, I'm talking 2020, 2021. It was the world the world gone mad. And it's going to be that like that to a whole nother level. And we're going to need perseverance during that time when this Antichrist comes on the scene. We're going to need perseverance of the saints to be able to endure those days and still be effective and still be good witnesses, and still want to help our family make it to the, to the goal, make it to the end, make it to the, the finish line, right? Because that's what we should hope. We should hope that we want each other to make it to the finish line. Any way I can make, help you, let me know. How I can make you help, help you make it to the finish line, help me. Your children, your family, your friends, your neighbors. I mean, God wants none to perish, but all to come to repentance. And that's the same attitude that we should have. So, we need perseverance. Isaiah 32 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Maybe that's what they should have did. They should have been praying. They should have been praying. They saw what Moses did before. He had built an altar. We read it in chapter 24. He built an altar to the Lord. He did it before that when they destroyed, when the God destroyed the Amalekites. He built an altar to the Lord. They knew how to worship the Lord. Moses already had given them the covenant of all the things that they were going to be doing to, to keep them safe in this, in this land they were about to pos- uh, uh, possess. Um, in the previous chapters, we read about the consecration of the priests, the sacrifices, the bronze altar, the garments for the priests, the court of the tabernacle. The people were going to donate their, their gold. Let me see. What do I have here? And the people agreed to all these things. When, in, in chapter 24, it says, when Moses came and told the people all the words of the ordinances, they all responded, all the words of the Lord have spoken, we will do. How many times have we said, Lord, I'll do it. Lord, I'll do it. I'll listen to you. We, I know we did that when we first said, when we first said, I do. When we first said, I do to the Lord. And it's a continual thing. We can continue to say, yes, Lord, I do. Yes, Lord, I will. Yes, Lord, I'll obey. And then we ask him and we pray and say, God, help me because I can't do it in my strength. It, it has to be in your strength. So it says here, back to uh, Exodus 32, it says that Moses delayed coming down. The people assembled about Aaron And said to him, come, make us a God. Come, make us a God who will go before us. It's actually right there. I don't know what your translation says, but it's make us gods. It's the plural form right there. They said, come, make us gods. Make us gods. Well, our God is one. Our God is one. He is the Lord of lords. He is the king of kings. It's like he's the God of gods. Okay, there's all these other guys. Remember what, what, what God did to the gods of Egypt? I mean, we talked about that. We talked about the plagues. Each one of the plagues that he put on Egypt, each plague represented a, a certain god that they had worshipped there. 
and, and God made, a, 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 made fools of them, made fools of those gods. He made fools of the, of the so-called God of this world, Pharaoh. Pharaoh considered himself the God of this world, basically, uh, a type of the devil, basically, a type of Satan, a type of Antichrist. And he, what did he do to him? Drowned his chariots, drowned his best officers, drowned him in the, in, in, in the Sea of Reeds. So they saw he was the one true God, and the people said, we're going to follow you. We agree. We'll follow you. We serve the one true God, you guys. All these other gods, whatever they, whatever they, whatever they are, whatever we've made them to be, all the gods of this world, I should say, none of those gods, none of those gods can do anything because we have one true God who is in control of all things. So Aaron says here, tear off, in verse 2, Aaron, tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. In Exodus 12, 35 and 36, the Israelites we read this before. The Israelites, they took their wealth from Egypt. Remember when, when, when Moses went and said, let my people go. He let them go with all their flock. The, the people also were able to take, and God showed favor on them, and the people were able to take their gold, their silver, and all their treasures from Egypt. And that's how much God had favor on them. They were able to take all those things with them. So they had these things. That's how the Israelites had all this, these things. But in Exodus 21, um. Or I should say in Exodus, yeah, in Exodus 21, we read about um, the ordinances in the covenant. If you guys remember, I, I mentioned it a little bit last week about the slaves. You know, in the Hebrews, concept of slavery was more bond servant. They were bond servants. They, they had to, they could serve to pay off debts and things like that, and they could serve for six years. But on the seventh year, they were to go free. The slaves were to go free, and they become, but they can become bond servants. They could choose to continue to follow. Their master, if they love their master, if their master was good to them, they would say, hey, I don't want to. I've been in service to this, this master, and he's been good to me, and, and, and I'm well taken care of. I don't want to go anywhere else. So they would choose to continue in servanthood as bond servants to the master. And in Exodus 21, 1 through 6, we read about what they would do. And it's also in Deuteronomy. We would read about what they would do. They would pierce their ears with an awe, and they would pierce it. In Deuteronomy, it says they would put it into, onto the door, and that we won't talk about exactly what, what that conveys, but they would pierce this. Well, a lot of commentators say that they would put, to keep these holes as representatives, they would put earrings in them. They would put earrings in them, in these holes. This showing that that person is now a bondservant to this master, perpetual for life. And this was like, and this is like a type of what we become. Once we were slaves of sin, once we were slaves to the world, but then we become slaves to a good master. We decide, we choose to be slaves to Christ, bond servants. If you read the epistles, you read how Paul and Peter, they start off as a bond servant to Christ. I'm a bond servant to Christ. They're, they're unashamed of calling themselves a slave to Christ. And that's what we become. When you decide to follow Jesus, you become a bond servant to a good master for, forever, forever. And that's what, they were, that's, what, that's what they were here. So they have these gold rings, earrings that represented their, their bond service to masters, to good masters. And I think to me, it's like a picture here of Aaron. That's the first thing he asked for is those representations of them being bond servants to a good master. Take those off. Let's melt them. And they tore them off. And the first things they were to do is get rid of that bond servant. Oh, what a shame if we say we no longer want to be bond servants to our master. He's just taking too long. He's not delivering me fast enough from this trial. He's not as good of a master as I thought he was. I, I want to break this covenant, this agreement that I have. When I decided to follow Jesus, I didn't really mean it. I wish I could just take off this, this yoke, this light yoke that he's given me. I wish I could just take it off and put on the heavy yoke of slavery, the burden of slavery. I could put that back on. At least then I could just work, work, work for it, right, by my own strength, did that work before for us? Will it ever work for us? Never. It never will. God is all in all. He gives us everything we need for life and godliness, and the trials are for perfection. That's what they're for. They're to make us more pure than gold. 
That's what, that's what the trials are for. Because that's this world that we're in, this fallen world we're in. It's, it's, it's a fallen world. One day it'll be new. But right now it's a fallen world that we're in. This world is, this earth is under a curse. But one day it'll be lifted when our Messiah comes back. So in Exodus 25, we talk about how they were making the, the, the altar, the altar of incense, the, the different instructions for the, uh, the, the garments for the priests, the bronze altar, the court of the tabernacle. Um, we talked about uh, the, the boards and the sockets and all these things, the Ark of the Covenant. And, and it starts off by saying in, in Exodus 25 that the people gave their gold. They started with gold. They gave their gold so it was meant for God. For, for the presence of God, all those things were representatives of what, what God was going to do to be present with the people. All these things that God was going to do to be present with the people. So those things were meant for gold, for God. Those things, gold. And here we see them saying, nope, the first thing they do is take off their gold rings and they make it for their gods, for their gods. God gives us things. He blesses us with things. He blesses each and every one of us with things, but they're for his good. They're for his glory. We're stewards. Everything we have belongs to God. He gives and he takes. That's what our Lord does. So everything we have, we need to just give it right back to him. However that looks for you individually, we need to hold these things in this world loosely, really. And everything that's just, seize every opportunity because these days are evil. Make the best use of our time. We can never get it back in this, in this earth. It's like one day we're going to meet a just God and we're going to give account, each and every one of us, for what we did with the blessings that he gave us, for the time that he gave us. So let's all be good stewards. Amen? Back to Exodus 32. Oh, let's see. Am I? So the golden calf, they used their ring. They made this golden calf. It says Aaron, he took it from their hands, and he fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a golden calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who bought, brought you up from the land of Egypt. Who brought you up from the land, land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. So the next day they rose early, offering burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, drink, and play. Oh boy, it started off with them just being impatient. It started off with them just, just not waiting on the Lord. Just not waiting on the Lord. I mean, it's, it's real subtle when we just be, start becoming impatient. Like, oh, man, what, what's your hurt? What, what, what's taking you so long, God? It just started there. And before you know, other things start looking tantalizing, start looking pleasurable to us. And we, before you know it, we start looking to other places other than God. Before you know it, we're not following the Lord like we said we would. And we're following Man, and that's kind of what Aaron did here. You know, Aaron is, is, is Moses' brother. He's been there since the beginning when they delivered people out of Egypt. He was Moses' mouthpiece. He helped him and her helped hose Moses' arms up. Remember that? During the battle against the Amalekites, while he was praying, it has he prayed. Joshua and the Lord defeated the Amalekites, so they held him up. So Aaron was being used. Um, he was going to be the high priest. But here we see him listening to the people, listening to the people. And it's like, oh boy, how sad it is when, when, when a leader listens to a man above the Lord. And we see it so often in, 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 in all over churchianity. We see so many pastors appeasing the people and listening to people and catering to the people instead of catering to God, instead of serving God and staying true to his word and being steadfast on his word. And we see compromise and compromise and compromise. And we see people, and then it leads, one compromise leads to another. And then we see the, the, the sin gets exposed, whether it's uh, money laundering, whether it's um, sexual immorality, we see it come out. But it starts with these compromising with God's word, with God's truth. And we see it over and over, over again. May we be a church that doesn't compromise, that holds to the truth, that isn't, isn't a respecter of people in, in that we're going to, preach and teach to tickle people's ears that we're going to preach what God wants us to preach. What We're going to preach what we need, not what we want. Amen? That's what we should do. We should tell each other what, what we need, not what we want. Because my flesh wants it easy. My flesh wants it easy. Just tell, me the, just tell me something easy. Tell me the good things. 
but I know that's not what's good for my spirit. I, I need the truth. I need the truth and love. That's what I need to hear. And I hope that's the same for you. And I hope the same for you, that we need to be honest with each other. Truth and love. We need to correct each other with gentleness, with gentleness. Please, let's do that, you guys. Let's do that with each other. Let's love each other that much. Let's love each other that much that we're willing to have those hard conversations with each other. Because we want to see each other make it to the finish line, amen? We do. We see here Aaron just said, all right, and he listened to the people. Before you know it, they made another god, and really not another god. It was a, a, an animal. It was a calf, a bull. There was a, a couple of gods in, in Egypt that represented bulls, that bulls represented some gods in Egypt. So like I said, it's not a far stretch for them to go back something that they already had seen before. Uh, they were signs of strength and fertility. Fertility, all right? What did the Lord tell the people? What did he tell the people? That he will multiply them. He will multiply their descendants, right? He will mul- it was the Lord who's in charge of them growing and multiplying, right? But they went back to this bull God, right? In, in this land of Canaan, they were gonna go in there as Baal. He was the, a, a bull God, he was a bull god. So they were surrounded by these guys. And this is the God that they made to represent the Lord. So, like I said, sin is subtle. Sin is subtle. Let us not, let us, let us, let us hate sin. I think that should be a prayer of all of ours. God, help me hate sin like you hate sin. Because God is the God of love. He God is love, but God hates. He does hate. He hates sin. He hates sin. He justifies the sinner, but never the sin. He's a holy God. He's a consuming fire. And he can have sin can have nothing to do with him. He cleans us. He washes us. When we draw near to him, he draws near to us. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. When we come to him in repentance, when we turn from our sins and turn to him, but it's a life of continual turning from. It's turning from them. I mean, literally, we're, 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 we're not going to turn from sin by sleeping on the Bible, by putting it under our pillow. We're just not. It's got to be intentional. It's got to be intentional for us. He'll give us everything we need. He'll give us the strength to do it. He gives us a body and brothers that we could pray with, and he gives us ministries that we could go to, like New Creation Ministry if we're struggling in certain areas. He gives us these things. God gave us everything we need if we're struggling with something. So we know that he wasn't supposed to use any graving tools, making the altars or making these things. We know the second commandment, don't make anything in heaven. He's violating. They made another God. Worship no other God. It's like uh, commandment one, commandment two. They're just dropping, right? They're just like, nope. They're just going against them, right? And... um, this is going to happen again throughout Israel's, uh, Israel's uh, uh, history. It's going to happen again in the days of Amos. They're going to have two bulls, north and the south. They're going to be worshiping the same thing. So this is something that's going to happen again. But we see here that this is the beginning right here of their, of their idol worship. The beginning of their, like I said, they came from idol worship. That's where they came from. You know, they served one God there, but they were among those who were in idol worship. So it says here that Aaron built an altar. He built an altar. Not only did he build the God, but he built an altar to it. Aaron, uh, Moses had built an altar, like I had said before. Now we have Aaron building an altar for this, this false God, this idol. Um, and it says the next day they rose, the people rose early, offered burnt offerings. Last time we read that Moses rose early, if you remember that. Ro- Moses, in uh, Exodus 24.4, Moses rose early to build an altar to the Lord. And here we see the people rising early to the altar to the Lord to bring offerings and peace offerings. So they didn't rise early for that altar, but they rose early for that. Oh, it's so sad when we, when we if, if this is something that they did right here, they actually rose early to sin. It says the people ate and drank and rose up to play. That word right there, play, is like lewdness, like they were lewd. They it, it, it's a verb. It's like they were actually, it's like premeditated. It's like premeditated. So if this is something that they just fell into because, hey, all of us could say, man, I, I stumbled. You know, I stumbled. I was doing this. This happened. 
I got upset. I got angry. The circumstance in my life, I, 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 I had a word of anger. I, I sinned. Um, I had an evil thought. I said something I should have said. I offended a brother. I apologize. But these things do happen. We do stumble, right? Because we're being perfected. But this is premeditated. Premeditated sin. Practicing sin. We're told that. We're told not to practice sin. We practiced sin before. We're told not to practice sin. And this is what they're doing now. They're practicing this. It started subtle, right? Just not being patient, not waiting on the Lord, you know, wanting to get ahead of him, wanting to make things happen because I'm just not going to wait for that special someone. I'm just going to make it happen. Uh, I just don't think that the Lord could, could uh, help me with this situation. I just have no peace. I'm just going to have a few drinks because I know that always helped me before. It'll help me again, right? Because I've been praying for peace and it's just not coming. So I'm just going to get into that a little bit, you know, and that'll, then it'll come. And it just starts off a little bit like that. And before you know it, the floodgates could be open. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. And before you know it, you're, 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 you're making plans to sin. You're rising up early to go start your day of sin, right? You're starting up early. You already know what you're going to do later on that day. It's so subtle. I've seen it before. Hey, I've been there before in my early days, right? But as we get older in Christ, it should not be like that. It should not be like that. We need to be growing in the Lord. We need to be maturing in the Lord, right? Those days are over. That new, that old man is dead. We're a new creation. We need to tell ourselves that and preach to ourselves and remind ourselves of that. Verse, uh, it's our pride at the end of the day. It's our pride. You know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's our self. Hey, it was before we knew the Lord, what was it? Selfism, right? That was our religion. If we didn't have another false religion, for one, for sure we had was religion of ourself. I do things my way. I, 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 maybe I had a, a different uh, idea of who God was. He was according, not the God of the scriptures because this God was okay with this. This God was okay with that. He's okay with these sins, but not okay with these. Kind of made a God in my own image. It says that God made us in his image. But what happens is we think we can make God in our image. We think we can say, hey, I have a God who's okay that if I have this kind of language. My God's okay. As long as I'm not doing those drugs, I'm all right. I can drink a little bit over here with these guys. Hey, I'm not going. At least I'm not going out till 2 in the morning. I leave at a decent time. We think about these things, and we think we can start doing it our way. And it goes back to that pride where I'm like, yeah, it's back to my way. And that's a real subtle one right there. Because it's like, it's, it, 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 it never worked before. It was never our way. It's about his way. And it says here that, God says here that they turn from the way. Before you know it, they turn from the way. Verse 7 says, verse 7 says, sorry. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, go down at once for your, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Oh boy. He says, God, it says, go down, and he calls them his people. I think that's pretty interesting there, that the Lord says it's your people. If we just jump real quick to verse 11, Moses entreats the Lord and says, Oh, Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought? God says, these are your people. You brought them. I, I think the Lord is, 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 is ashamed it reminds me of, 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 of when, you know, me and my, my, my wife see our daughter do something that she shouldn't do. And I'm like, did you see what your daughter did? <laughs> did you see what your daughter did? It's like, why? Oh, every time she does something bad, she's my daughter, right? Not our daughter, not your daughter. And I, I see that here, right? We see that here. The Lord says, hey, look at your people who you brought out from there. Who brought them out? Yeah, by the hand, by, by the hand of Moses, but it was God who sent Moses to bring them out. Whose people are they? They're God's people, his chosen people. But the Lord here, sad to say, he's not pleased. The Lord is not pleased here. He's actually ashamed. It shows some shame here. He's ashamed of his children. He really is. He doesn't even want to say they're my people. He says they're your people that you brought out. Jesus actually says, if you confess me before people, I'll confess you before my God before the Father. But he says, but if you deny me before people, I will die, deny you before the Father. And I see God here 
Jesus being God, I see God here saying, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm, it's like he's denying them here. They're your people. You brought them out. They've corrupted themselves, he says. It says in verse 8, they have quickly turned aside. They have quickly turned aside from the way. The way Jesus is the way. It's so sad when we quickly turn aside from him, when we go through things. God is so good. He gives us chance after chance and gives us trial after trial. And sometimes they're the same trials because he wants to perfect us. He doesn't want to see, he doesn't want to see us fail. He doesn't, he doesn't allow us to go through trials so that we fail. That's what the devil does. That's what the devil does. The devil, the devil, you know, comes to still kill and destroy because he wants us to stumble. He wants us to fall away. He wants us to turn back. But that's not what our Lord does. The Lord doesn't do that. He wants to, us to know that we're approved, to know that we could depend on him, to know that we could count on him, to know that if we stick with him, he'll get us through no matter what. And that's what the Lord does for us, for his people. Nevertheless, he, say, he says here, he says I'm, I'm, they're, they're, they're obstinate. They're an obstinate people. They're stiff-necked. They're stiff-necked people. The Lord sees them. What does that mean? What does it mean that they literally have bad, like this image right here, like they have bad necks, their necks are hurt. They're stiff-necked. They're, they're obstinate. They're stubborn, like a mule, like a donkey. They're stubborn. They're stiff-necked. He's not just talking about their physical, right? Because the Lord's seen what they're doing. He's seen that they've corrupted themselves. He says they turned out of the way. He says that they made themselves a molten calf. So the Lord sees all. He saw that they made a molten calf. He saw that they were worshiping it and that they were sacrificing it. The Lord sees all. He sees everything that we're doing. And it's like, oh, God, I'm sorry. I got caught. You see that. But it's more than that here. He says they're stiff-necked. They're stubborn. The Lord sees our heart. The Lord sees all the way down to our heart because at the end of the day, it's not so much about the symptom or the outcome of our sin. It's, it's what's the underlying problem. It's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. And the only one who could operate on that heart is the great physician, our God. He's the only one who could operate on the heart. He's the only one who could change our heart. And the only way that to get that accomplished is by coming to him in humility and not saying sorry for getting caught for doing the things and for things not working out right because he saw that things didn't work out right. It's obvious to everyone that things didn't work out right because we hurt, our sins hurt other people as well. But we can't just say, okay, God, I'm sorry, I'm gonna do better. No, no, there's something else there that we need to ask God for help with. It's our heart, our heart. Lord, find out what's in me. See if there's evil, an evil thing in me, Lord God. Know my anxious thoughts. Know my heart, Lord, and ask those kind of prayers. And he will, because it's going to hurt. And he's going to reveal those things to us. But until we see those things for ourselves, we will never be convinced of our nature. We'll never be convinced of our wicked heart so that we could repent and turn from it and ask God to give me a clean heart. So we ask him, God, help me, show me. Because we, we're, not, we're not perfect. We're being perfected. I keep saying it. We don't know everything. We haven't arrived. Sometimes people see this, if we're having the same issues with different people because there's probably something going on that we can't see. So in, instead of saying, you know what, they're all wrong, God, what is it in me? What is it in me? What's going on here? Do I have a stiff neck? Most likely it is. <laughs> Most likely that's what it is. The Lord sees our hearts. The Lord said, I see my people. And then he says, now let me, he tells Moses, leave me alone. Let me alone that my anger may burn against them. He want, he, he just, I don't want to hear it, Moses. I don't want you to pray for him. I don't want you to intercede for him. I don't want to hear anything. I just, just leave me alone. I'm going to destroy them, he says. I want to destroy them. That's how upset our God is. That's our God. Same yesterday, today, and forever. That's our God. If not for the intercession, if not for the intercession, right? If not for somebody to go in in our behalf. And here we see Moses going in behalf of the Israelites. We have one greater than Moses, right? That went in our place, that went in our behalf. Moses is propositioned here, basically. He says, I will destroy them and make you a great nation. Moses could have jumped at that and said, oh, I didn't do anything. I've been up here with you for 40 days and 40 nights. Go on, destroy away. You're gonna make me a great nation? Moses could have jumped on that opportunity. 
I'm still going to have a great nation. It's going to be mine. <laughs> Moses, but we, we read in Numbers 12, 3, that Moses was more humble than anyone on the face of the earth. Moses and God and, and Jesus were, 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 were called meek. They were called meek. Like I said, Moses is a type of Christ. An example. That's what we need. Humility for our stiff neckedness. <laughs> is that even a word? For our stubbornness, for our pride, for those little subtle sins that we allow to creep in. We need to admit, confess, repent, turn to God and ask for forgiveness. And then God, help me follow you. Help me obey you. We need humility like Moses. We need humility of Jesus. Verse 11 says, Then Moses entreated them, entreated the Lord, and we need prayer. We need prayer. Moses entreated the Lord, his God, and said, Oh Lord, why does your anger burn against your people whom you have brought out of the land of land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? See, Moses was a humble man. God said, your people, you brought them out. Moses said, oh no, Lord, they're your people. You brought them out. You brought them out. Why should the Egyptians speak saying with evil intent, he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth? Moses is thinking about the people. The, what, the, what are the Egyptians gonna say? They're gonna, they're gonna mock you, God. What does the world say when they see God's people, God's children, God's chosen people, when, it, when they see them in revelry, in sin, participating with the sins of the world. What, is, what does the world say? How do they look at our God? They say there's no God at all. There's no power in him. He hasn't changed your life. It might have worked when you tried him for a little while. You tried Jesus for a lo- little while. He didn't work. There's no power in that. When they see us, you guys, when they see believers living like the world, living like hell, our God is mocked and he's not glorified. And that's what Moses is saying here. What are the Egyptians going to say? What are they going to say when they see your people here making other gods like they used to worship in Egypt, like the Egyptians used to worship? When they see them worshiping them and bowing them down, what are the people going to say? He says, why should the Egyptians say this? Turn from your burning anger. He pleads with God, turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. The power of prayer, the power of Moses' intercession right here for the people. Uh, We got a little bit of time here. Let's turn to Luke 18 real quick, a parable that Jesus gives a parable on prayer, on persistent and fervent prayer. Luke 18, verse 1 says, Now he was telling them a parable to show them at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, In a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him. She kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but after what he said to himself, this is, this is um, the judge. Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because the widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the right, unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night and will delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? That's pretty awesome right there because I think about this, how that ends right there in prayer. He's interceding for prayer. He's interceding, right? We're talking, we're talking about this widow interceding to this judge. And he's an unrighteous judge. Imagine how righteous God is, right? He is righteous. He is righteous. The epitome of righteousness. He... Moses is interceding for him, just like this widow's doing. And then Moses comes comes down from the mountain when he was with God, comes down. And what does he find? The people having an orgy. They were in reverie. They were worshiping a false god. They weren't living by faith. They weren't living by faith. So similar to this right here. Will will the Son of Man come back? When the Son of Man came for you today, what's he going to find? Will he find faith? When he comes back the second time, is he going to find faith? Oh, he's going to have a remnant. Oh, oh yes. 
Are we going to be part of that? Are we going to be part of those that are ready, that don't shrink back from his appearing? That we could stand there blameless, washed by the blood of the lamb? That's, that's, that's those who continue and endure and who are steadfast and who overcome. And it takes prayer, prayer, prayer. I'll say it again. And we just met, I started this today by saying we meet for prayer at six o'clock on Wednesdays. We meet for prayer at 10 o'clock. Last Sunday of the month, we have prayer meeting here. Please come. It's power of prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't grow weary in doing good. It's good to pray. Pray like your life depends on it because it does. Pray like others' lives depend on it because it does. Our God, we, the God, our Lord is perfect. And even when he changes mind, that's perfect as well. He works all things together for good. The Lord is perfect and he'll always be perfect. James says to ask in faith and don't doubt. Don't be double-minded. We need to come to, to the Lord with faithful prayers, fervent, persistent, and keep praying. Keep praying for your loved ones and don't give up. And don't start seeking other means, but keep asking, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. Don't give up. We get not because we ask not. Uh, let's see. The Lord changed his mind. Verse 15. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, which were in on both sides, and they were on one side. Then the tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing, engraved in the tablets. So he comes down with the Decalogue, comes down with the Ten Commandments, and, and it says here that when Joshua heard the sound of the people, and they shouted, as they shouted, he said, there's sound of war in the camp. That's pretty, that's pretty funny to me, because Joshua is a warrior. Remember, he fought the Amalekites. He's a warrior. He's an assistant of Moses. He went up the mountain with him, and he comes down. And he's like, it was just funny to me. He's just like, hey, is that a war I right hear? It was like, am I missing? Am I missing a fight? That's what it's, that's what Joshua sounds like. Hey, am I missing the rumble? You know, that's what Joshua sounds like to me here. Am I missing the fight? But then he says, wait a minute, that's not a sound of triumph, nor is it a sound of defeat. What is this? It's a sound of singing. I mean, it's almost as if it would have been better if he would have heard something going on that had to do with the people fighting. You know, something was it a, some sort of triumph, some sort of defeat. I mean, because we're going to have defeats. We do. We, 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 lose, we lose some battles, but we want to win the war, right? The war against evil, the war against sin in our lives. We want to fight the good fight. But yeah, sometimes, yeah, sometimes we, we fall, but then we get back up. God forgives us and he says, go, keep going, don't give up. And that's what we got to do is just not give up and keep going. But what we don't do is stay in the middle. We don't stay neutral. We don't put it on cruise control ever, right? We keep fighting. I'd rather see someone struggling than just pacifying and just going through life, being okay with their sin. You know, I'm okay. And I think God's okay with it too. Back to creating God in in our own image. I think God's okay with this. I'm going to stay right here. I'm neither hot, I'm neither cold, I'm just going to stay right here in this lukewarm area right here. And God says, no, that's the worst place to be. Jesus says in Revelation, what's what's he going to do? We know. Let's fight. Let's fight. Let's keep fighting, you guys, together, arm in arm, right? It's a battle. We're in in a spiritual warfare here. And how do we win that? with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in prayer, with the garments of Christ. Body armor on, right? With Christ's armor, spiritual armor on. And we don't take it off. And we give everything that God equipped us with, and we, we keep it, and we keep it on. Amen? Uh, so verse 19, it says, it came about as soon as... Yeah. Then it came about... As soon as Moses came near the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned. So Moses, humble as he was, he still had anger. He had this righteous anger of the Lord. He is upset, and we should feel the same way about sin. We really should. He threw the tablets and shattered them because they broke the law. They broke the law. They, they violated the commandments. He broke them. He said, this is what you did. You broke the law. They broke the, he broke the tablets 
at the foot of the mountain where they met God. He took the calf. Oh, I love this. And this is what we should all, this is our example of what we should all do right here. Is he took the calf, which they had made, and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. He made them drink it. He destroyed that idol. He destroyed that calf. He didn't just destroy it. He burned it with fire and ground it into powder, into nothing. And if that wasn't enough, he scattered it all over the water. And then he said, now drink it. And I've seen commentators say, yeah, I drank it because then it's going to become excrement and it's really going to be done away with, like completely. I see something different here. I really do. I see drinking this, 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 it's like the cup of God's wrath. I see it as drinking, and, and we learn in Jeremiah, a prophet was to go to them and tell them to repent because they were getting into all the sorts of sin, of idolatry. And in Jeremiah 25, I wish we had more time to go there. I mean, next time we will. But it talks about the cup of God's wrath, not only for, for Babylon, but also for God's people, Judah, that they were going to be drinking the cup of God's wrath. And I think this is a, the beginning of that right here is like, okay, God's not going to destroy you. He changed his mind about destroying you, but there's still going to be some wrath you're going to experience here because we read a little bit later and we'll get to it next time. Thousands were killed. Maybe the ones, the, 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 the rebel rousers, maybe the ones who, who, who started it, the ones who really, the leaders, who really got this, this, this Aaron, you know, to make a God, the ringleaders perhaps. Maybe most of the, some of the camp went into their tents and got on their knees and prayed to the Lord. We don't know, but he didn't destroy them all. But some were destroyed. Some were destroyed. So there was wrath. Some of God's wrath was poured out. And so he has them drink this. He has them drink this. We got a few verses here, and then we'll be finished. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We've read this several times as we've been going through Exodus. These are the examples. It reminds us that, that these old, this Old Testament scriptures are the examples for us, written for us, for our example. How to avoid Israel's mistakes. How to avoid Israel's mistakes. Um, I'll just start from verse 11. It says, Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. The ends of the ages have come, my brothers and sisters, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. That's for all of us right there, you guys. If we think we're good, we think we're standing, and no, I just, it just can't happen, just take the example of the Israelites who thought everything God delivered them from and the way he, all the miracles he performed and all what he saved them from, that, that they fell. Take heed who thinks he stands, lest he does not fall. No temptation is overtaking you, but such is coming to man. But God is faithful. So we need to look to the one true God because he is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you were able. But with a temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Flee from idolatry. If it stops you from getting closer to God, then it needs to go. If it, gets, if, it, if, it, if it takes place of God in your life, then it needs to go. If it's the, even a little bit more of a priority in your life than God in your life, then getting closer to God in your life, then it needs to go. He says, Paul says, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as wise, you judge what I say. Verse 16, is not the cup of blessing which he blessed a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation of Israel. All those who eat, all are the, not those who eat the sacrifices, shares in the altar. What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the thing with the Gentiles sacrificed, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. There's always demons behind these idols. The devil's always wanted worship, and that's what these demons want. They want worship. So if we have anything in our lives that take place, that take the place of God, that's an idol in our life. And guess what? That's the devil's plan. That's what the devil wants. He doesn't want God to be your priority. And he'll use anything, even things that appear to be good, take the place of God. 
And that's what he wants. That's what these demons want. Verse 21 says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You just cannot. We do not want to provoke the Lord to jealousy, it says in verse 22. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? And that's what, we serve a jealous God, you guys. We can't cheat on him. We can't cheat on him. We have to be, he is faithful. And he expects us to be faithful as well, right? Really, we just can't commit adultery on him. We can't cheat on him with the world, with sin, or with anything else that gets first place. We can't give anything else first place in our life, right? A few more verses here. Uh, Galatians, Galatians, Galatians 5. So they were, the, 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 Galatians were, were, were bewitched by the Judaizers. They were putting new things on them, circumcision. You know, if you want to really be a Christian and follow Jesus, you need to, the Gentiles need to get circumcised. There was a council in Jerusalem. They said, nope, that's not true. Other things, foods and stuff like that. But no, um, they were trying to get them to, to really be Jewish and, and follow some Jewish customs that they didn't have to. We were, uh, Galatians explained that it's, we're saved by, by, by faith in Christ. You know, grace, faith in Christ, it says in Ephesians. But they quickly turned away. Paul is grieved by it. He says, you're quickly turned away. He, he actually says, I, 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 uh, these are, you're my people. I, I, I would sacrifice myself for you. I would go to hell for you guys in your place. You know, Moses couldn't do that. But Jesus was willing to lay his life down for us. And he was the acceptable sacrifice for us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Chapter 5 of Galatians it says uh, in verse 13, I'll start, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity to the flesh. But through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in the statement, You shall love your brother and neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by, by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For there is opposition one another, so that you do not do the things you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. evident: Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, infamy, strife, jealousy, outbursts, anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, things like these. That's what the Israelites were getting into, had got into by not waiting on the Lord, not, not continuing to... Believe in the invisible God. And, and, and we're told here by Paul and, and told the Galatians are told here, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice those things, remember they were premeditated. They rose early. It didn't start there though. They just didn't want to wait on the Lord. It said, now those who belong to, to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Against, their thing, against such things, there is no law. We live by the faith. Let us walk by the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, sorry, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us walk by the Spirit, brothers and sisters. And we will overcome. I'm just going to 1 John 5. 1 John 5 here. Uh, 1 John 5. Oops. Whoever believes that Jesus is Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know we love God. We love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments aren't burdensome. They're for our own good, I'll add. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is a victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Oh, Lord, increase our faith. That's what we need to ask the Lord to do. Increase our faith. It ends here. I'll go to verse 18 real quick. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who is born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. It's true for temporarily, for a short, more, a short time. Yes, this whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And he ends this here. The beloved John ends, ends this letter here with little children, guard yourselves from idols. 
let Christ reign in your hearts, brothers and sisters. Prioritize, prioritize. Put Christ first in your lives. Destroy your idols. What did we say before? What are the remedies to our stiff neckedness? What are the remedies? Humility, humbling ourselves. Humbling ourselves, praying, overcoming in Christ, getting rid of our idols or anything that comes between us and God. Hebrews, and then we'll end there. Therefore, since we have uh, chapter 12, therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to consider him, you guys. It says here in verse 3, consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We got to fight our sin, you guys. We got to not grow weary in doing good. We got to destroy our idols. We got to humble ourselves and the Lord will exalt us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you. We praise you for you are our God and we are your people. We thank you for your chosen people. Because of them, Lord God, we were grafted in, Lord God. We know, Lord God, that that you didn't completely uh, you didn't completely just let go and 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 cut off all of Israel, Lord God. You still have your remnant, Lord God. You you didn't you you cut off branches, Lord, but the olive tree is still there, Lord God. And we pray for the priests of Jerusalem, Lord God. Help us to bless Israel, Lord God. We thank you for them, Lord God. We thank you for our father Abraham, Lord God, and all those, Lord that all those spiritual fathers, Lord God, that came before us, the cloud of witnesses that surround us, Lord God. Help us to think about the faith that they had, Lord God, and help us now, Lord, to lay aside every encumbrance, Lord, and every sin that entangles us, Lord. Help us to run with endurance. Help us to fix our eyes on you, Lord. Help us to trust you until the very end. Help us to endure. Be with my brothers and sisters, Lord. We love you, God. We thank you. We praise you for you are good. You are a one true God. Help us, Lord God. We love you, Lord. Thank you for dying for us, Jesus. Thank you for taking up your life. No greater love than to lay your life down for a friend. And the fact that you call us your friends, Lord God, it blows my mind, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.